Boy, I, I feel like I've, I've been at rest. <laughs> I've got to crank it up for the sermon now. Yeah, thank you, Choir. That was awesome. You know, we do live in an arid land, you know, a desert, really, and we get uh, water from the Feather River Project, from Colorado River, from the Sierra Nevada. If it wasn't for that, we would not be able to sustain the population we have and all the lush vegetation that is around us. Contrast that with my six years in Shreveport, Louisiana, where the average rainfall there is over uh, nine, uh, 50 inches of rain per year. And in 1990, there was over 90 inches of rain. And that's a lot of water. Uh, and for this Southern California kid, I, you know, I couldn't stand the water after a while. It was amazing. It rained so much. One time I was preaching with a large rainstorm outside, and right in front of the pulpit it was like a spigot of water was turned on as a, as a roof leak. And they rushed to get a bucket and put it under that, and I had to change my sermon to what you're going to hear today, about preaching about living water. <laughs> you know, it's no wonder that uh, a lot of images in the Bible are about the sustaining nature of water, its cleansing features, its its sustenance, its nourishment that it gives to us, and that God uses that, that metaphor to communicate uh, His truth, love, and provision for you and I spiritually. But we're going to look at the story of the woman at the well, uh, which is one story in a series of sermonettes that John is, is remembering and laying down to communicate to us that uh, we can't do it alone, that we need the living water of the Holy Spirit to be within us. So hear the word of God. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus is making and baptizing more disciples than John, although it was not Jesus himself, but his disciples were baptizing, he left Judea and started back to Galilee. But he had to go through Samaria. So he came to the Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given his son Joseph. And Joseph's well was there. Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well, and it was about noon. The Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. The disciples had gone into the city to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. And Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is, I lost my place. <laughs> if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is speaking to you and asking for a drink of water, he would give you living water. I'm sorry, I still lost my place. <laughs> this is the third time through this. I should have had this down memorized. Jesus uh, said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. Now the water I will give will become in them a spring of water, gushing up to eternal life. This woman said to him, Sir, give me this water, so that I may never be thirsty, or have to keep coming to draw water. And Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come back. And the woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you're right in saying you have no husband, for you have uh, had five husbands, and the one you are with now is not your own. What you have said is true. Now the woman said to him, sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know, we worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now it is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship Him. God is spirit, those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. And the woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ, and when He comes, He will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Again, may God rest, uh, reveal to us and bless to us his word. Let's pray. Lord God, we pray your spirit to you. Fill us, help 
Help us have understanding of your word that is spoken in the today. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, at the time of this encounter with Jesus, uh, it was the middle of the day, and Jesus and his disciples were traveling seven, you know, uh, on a 70-mile journey from Jerusalem up to Sychar. Now, you might um, see on this map how, how it... Uh, how they went from Jerusalem. You know, the Jews didn't go through Samaria because they had animosities towards one another, so they usually went to the east side of the Jordan River, which came down from Galilee into the Dead Sea. And they would traverse up uh, along the side of uh, Samaria so they wouldn't interact with the Samaritans. Or they would go to the west along the Mediterranean, and it would take longer, but then they wouldn't have to uh, interact with the Samaritans that way. But Jesus... And this particular occasion felt that he had, that little word had there, to go through Samaria, according to the scripture. And we don't know whether the Holy Spirit had already revealed to him the divine appointment that he had for him at the well in, at Sychar, but, uh, or whether that was revealed later. But we do know that Jesus must have felt some kind of urge to go through Samaria rather than go around. The Holy Spirit had a mission for it, a divine appointment with the Samaritan woman at Joseph's well. Now, I like the fact that the scripture talks about Jesus being weary after a long morning of traveling and that he had to sit down at the well uh, to be refreshed. And he sent the disciples in to get some fast food from the local McDonald's or whatever. And so uh, while they were gone, this woman uh, comes up. But before the woman, woman is there, you know, his, we get a glimpse of Jesus' humanness. He is the incarnate Son of God, fully God and fully human. I like the fact that John says that he got weary and had to rest and wait, and even got thirsty. Jesus is fully human, definitely, and fully God. He experiences all that you and I experience. Well, while Jesus rested there, this woman approached him. She's carrying her large water jar, and I'm sure it got really heavy to carry. <coughs> I get the sense that women in those days were really buff and strong. <laughs> and uh, she had to carry that heavy jar back to uh, her um, home in Sychar. It was also noticed that uh, Jesus noticed that she was walking alone, and it was the middle of the day. Women usually went to the wells in the morning or in the afternoon. Um, they usually were in a group of people for security, but also to touch base and share the, the news of the day. Um, but we get the sense that she is a loner, she's an outcast, and Jesus um, focuses on that in this conversation. Um, she has, uh, um, uh, uh, she's walking alone and coming to the well alone because uh, of the ridicule perhaps, or maybe her sense of self-worth was not very high at that point, um, when, and to be around other women at the time. Now, to the Jews, Samaritans were considered unclean. They were a mere subspecies of, that, that originated after the Assyrians came down and captured the northern kingdom, Israel, and, and carted everybody away on the Babylonian captivity. Um, the women that were left, you know, were mated with other Syrian men so that they could be assimilated into the Syrian pagan culture. Uh, this didn't sit very well with the Jews who wanted to keep their race pure and uh, clean. Uh, to honor God. And so when the Jews came back from being in captivity, uh, there was a lot of animosity. Even though the, Sir the Samaritans um, uh, studied the first five books of, of, the, uh, of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch, the books of Moses, uh, they didn't recognize the rest of the remaining books, and they lost out on all the richness that was there in the Old Testament. Um, but they still weren't accepted by uh, the Jews, and so they remained uh, uh, in animosity towards one another, and the Jews abhorred and rejected the Samaritans. Uh, given this history, the woman was naturally startled when Jesus, you know, opened up a conversation and even requested for her to give him a drink. Well, Jesus was without prejudice and cross cultural barriers between men and women and Jews and Samaritans. We see this all the time. His mission was to come and love all people. Uh, his mission was to save the world. And so to have a conversation in this situation was not unusual for Jesus, 
unusual for the woman and for the culture. Furthermore, Jesus, uh, the very Son of God, humbled himself in this situation by asking for a drink, being dependent upon the woman, since he didn't have anything to draw the water out of the well with, and she did. I like this strategy. In the same way that Jesus makes himself accessible to the woman at the well, he makes himself accessible to us. He meets us where we are. Um, he even gets underneath us and lifts us up in order for us to not feel threatened or um, out of control. He allows us to have conversation with him in his point of need as well. Sadly, there are too many people in our world who don't feel welcomed into the Christian communities and churches. Many people feel that they're disqualified from uh, the, the churches around because of their historical or even their cultural background. But the reality is that no one is cut off from the Lord. All are welcome, and Jesus is modeling that for us. Joni and I attended a 20-year celebration on Friday night of a prison ministry called Second Chance. It was founded by a man named C.J. Warndorf of the church where Joni is now on staff. And um, 20 years ago, when he was invited, he was a worship leader pastor at this congregation, and uh, he was invited to go to a women's camp of, of prisoners who worked out in the forest to bring his, his worship team and to play music and connect with people. And little did he know that that was the very beginning of a, of a very concentrated and specific ministry to inmates. And he has since traveled to all the different penitentiary, penitentiaries up and down uh, California and Arizona and Louisiana, uh, ministering through music and connecting with people and then uh, sharing with them the gospel of Jesus Christ. At this celebration, there were many uh, former inmates who are now um, out and who have been transformed by uh, the ministry that, uh, that CJ brought to them. He cared for them, he was compassionate with them, shared the gospel with them, and they received Christ and then incorporated that as they came out of uh, prison into uh, radically changed lives. And uh, it's, it was a joy to hear their stories as they witnessed. This man crossed barriers as Jesus did and shared the gospel and made them feel valued and welcomed just as Jesus did with this woman. Well, after the woman, the woman's initial surprise that Jesus was speaking to her, she says, how is it that you, a Jew, ask me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink? Jesus responded by challenging her curiosity with a clue, revealing who he was, and saying this in verse 10, look at it. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Now it should sound a little bit familiar with last week's passage that we studied in John chapter 3. Uh, it's, it's Jesus saying basically the same thing he said to Nicodemus in 3.16. The gift of God is before you. That's me. And I'm saying to you, give me a drink. And you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Remember Nicodemus said, well, Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born from above, and you will live, and you will grow, and you will really understand. Here, he's saying, you must have living water in me to, uh, to have everlasting life. Well, the woman at the well at first looked, took Jesus literally and responded with a little ignorance and perhaps cynicism. How could a mere man without even a bucket claim to draw living water from this well, she thought. She couldn't believe that Jesus was greater than her patriarch Jacob, or maybe so, but how is he going to do this? Well, Jesus' offer struck at the heart of her problem. We all have problems, and Jesus saw right to it. She tried to satisfy her human thirst for identity and purpose and security in a series of relationships that left her emotionally bankrupt and disgraced. Only the living water could satisfy her inner thirst by offering a new and eternal life, true fulfillment, and security in Christ. All her life, a woman had believed that the remedy for her thirst was to go through a sacred well only to return home spiritually thirsty. Her religious traditions fell short. Her hope for the Messiah was dim. But Jesus met her at her point of need and gave her new hope 
divine and gracious gift. She just needed to spend a little more time with him to hear it. What Jesus wanted to give this woman was eternal life and the gift of himself, not only the gift of himself, but the gift of the Holy Spirit, which he called living water. In John chapter 7, we get a little bit more definition of what living water is in verses 37 through 39. Let's look at that. On the last day of the festival, the great day, when Jesus was standing there, he cried out, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me, and let, one, let the one who believes in me drink. As the scripture has said, out of the believer's heart shall flow rivers of living water. Now he said this about the spirit which believers in him were to receive. As of yet, there was no spirit because Jesus was not yet glorified. Now while the woman was a recipient of the work of the Holy Spirit at the moment through Jesus, he could, she could receive that same Holy Spirit to live within her and quench her deep thirst spiritually and be a flowing river to splash all over others. She's getting a foretaste of, of what that living water was in her encounter with Jesus as he loved her, as he valued her, as he took this woman who was marginalized and brought her into the center of acceptance. When we put our faith in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit takes residence in our hearts much like a well that's filled to overflowing, and such, so much so it, it overflows and splashes on others. As we learn to avail ourselves to the working of the Holy Spirit, He gushes up and splashes all over everyone around us. Do you feel the Holy Spirit splashing on you today by someone sitting next to you? Is there some love and some joy and acceptance and value coming from them? That's what Jesus is talking about. Our only need is to ask for the gift, to receive it from the giver of all good and perfect gifts. Well, after trying to reach the woman with the gospel, she interprets it practically. I think I would too, as a way, oh, I don't have to run out here to the well every day and draw this water. It's just going to, I'm going to have, you know, my thirst quench forever. The Lord knew that if this woman were to receive the help that, that he desired to give, she would have to. Let him diagnose her deeper problems. Let him get underneath there a little bit more. And so he asks the question. It seems out of context, but it really gets to the heart of the matter. He says, go call your husband and come back. She had to understand that there was a craving in her, much like a physical thirst, a craving that she attempted to fill repeatedly with the next man in a series of marriages. After five husbands, she had finally de despaired of finding the right one, and instead of, of marrying this man, she was just living with him, the sixth person. And she responded truthfully, and the Lord thanked her for that, when she said, I have no husband. And although she was partially truthful, Jesus acknowledged that it could be that she wasn't ready yet to admit or to take full responsibility for her painful choices in life. So it might be a different excuse for you and I in our lives as we evaluate what we are trying to satisfy and fill, um, but find ourselves thirsty again. We might be saying, well, I have no job, or I have no money, or I have no respect, no joy or attractiveness. No one loves me. No one understands me. I'm a victim. The merry-go-round of new relationships or a new job or self-improvement schemes or new religions or all the trips to an empty well of promises don't add up very much into our lives. We still are hungry and thirsty for something more, something that we can only fill with God's righteousness. Each one of those seems to satisfy for a moment, but then the thirst Returns. Well, the woman's answer is a step forward in understanding her true need. And when Jesus responded further by saying, the fact is that you have five husbands and the man you're with now is not, suddenly the woman knew that there was this was no ordinary man that she was talking to. She said, sir, I can see that you, 
or a prophet. After all, he just read her mail, didn't he? He didn't know a thing about her until she, or she didn't think he knew anything about her until he said that. Now notice the progression of Christology here. You know, at first she thinks he's just a Jewish man, and then after a little bit of conversation, she says, "Why, maybe this guy's a little better, a little greater than our our um, patriarch Jacob." Uh, and then she pronounces him, he must be a prophet after he read a veil. And then, later on, she goes back into Sychar and says, well, hey, this might be the Christ. And so you can see how her Christology is elevated one truth at a time. And isn't that the way it is with you and I? We're introduced to a little bit of Christ and we, we lift our faith. And we're introduced to a little bit more truth and our faith is lifted and so forth until we understand and acknowledge and confess that he is indeed the Messiah. Now the Samaritan woman was getting excited as she discovers that there was more to Jesus than met the eye. Suddenly she realized that the subject of her was getting a little too close for comfort and she changes the subject to something that she thought was more important. That big religious debate between Samaritans and Jews about which mountain was, it, was the correct mountain to worship God. And so she asked that question. Jesus is patient with her and gives a little bit of a sermonette here about worship. It's one of the best little paragraphs that we have about Jesus' view of what worship is all about. And basically he is saying uh, it's, there's going to come a time in which you and I live in where it doesn't matter what mountain you worship the Lord on. Because of the living water that I give, the Holy Spirit living with us, you can worship and connect with God anywhere. Pastor Don Muma once said, uh, she came to draw a water, and she left with a well, well of living water, gushing up and splashing all over everything, and with all these little sermonettes. A.J. Gordon, one of the founders of Gordon-Conwell um, Seminary Divinity School, told of being out walking uh, one day, when looking across the field, saw a man pumping furiously on a pump, gushing water out of the pump, and, he, and this guy didn't stop. He kept on pumping and pumping, and he thought, how is this guy not getting tired uh, and pumping all this water? And he kept on going for a long time, so he thought, I need to investigate and ask this guy where he's getting all this energy, and as he got closer, he realized it wasn't a man at all. It was really a mannequin, and this artesian well was bubbling up and running the pump. <laughs> and isn't that a great illustration of the Holy Spirit working in us? He gushes up from within. And all that love and joy and peace and patience and self-control and goodness and kindness and all that fruit of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit, it's all, it's not about our working harder, it's about the Holy Spirit working us. That's living water. It's not static. It's a river of water moving. And anybody can tell you any stationary water is not good to drink. It's no good, really. But water that moves is what you want to drink from. That's the stuff that's going to give life. That's the Holy Spirit's work. And that's what God is calling us. To believe in Him and He will give rivers of living water. Now you may feel dry today. You may be feeling that uh, you're drained out or in need of uh, quenching a thirst. And Jesus is saying, I got just what you need. Believe in me, and I'll give you the thing, the water that will quench your thirst forever and ever is the living water. And yeah, you don't have to ask for it over and over again. It's there for you all the time. Now, you may be struggling with materialism, trying to quench thirst for that, or addictions, or whatever it is that you've tried to quench that thirst within you. And God is saying to you today, Receive the rivers of living water and live yourself. Not only eternally, but live in the now. Splashing over and gushing over so that others might live as well. Amen? Let us pray. Well, Lord God, thank you for this message and for how it reminds us that uh, it's not about what we do, but about all the gifts that you give us in Christ and the Holy Spirit living within us. Help us, Lord, to uh, uh, 
you know, to unplug where that water might be plugged up and to let it flow and splash over all of our family and friends and people we work with. Help us to express the joy and the love and the self-control and the goodness and the kindness and everything that is that characterizes the Holy Spirit within us uh, as we go through life. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.